So Jeff Weber earned a bachelor's degree in biology at Eckerd College and started his career with the Florida Park Service in 1985. He worked as a state park ranger at various central Florida parks, including Gamble Plantation State Historic Site, Caledesi Island State Park, and Wakiwa Springs State Park, if I'm saying those right. In 1989, he became the district biologist within the Florida Park Service, working at Oscar Shear State Park in Sarasota. Then in 1992, he accepted his current position as environmental specialist with Sarasota County Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources, where he enjoys the many rewards and the occasional challenge of managing five Sarasota natural area reserves. And today he's going to be presenting noteworthy plants of Southwest Florida, including rare and endemic species, local specialities and problematic exotics found in our region. So Mr. Weber, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to you. And you are welcome to now share, and I'm going to mute myself and also turn off my video. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, let's see. This worked in when we tried it, so hopefully it'll work now. All right, so can everybody see the screen okay? Okay. All right, for those who don't know me, my name's Jeff Weber. I'm an environmental specialist with Sarasota County Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources. And I will be celebrating 30 years with Sarasota County Parks in January. So it's been a, a long career. Um, it's been a great career. Um, and I currently manage five of our county parks and preserves. Uh, those are Redbug Slough Preserve, Old Mayaka Preserve, Circus Hammock Preserve, the Larry Manning Preserve and Center Gate, which no one knows about, and Bayonne Preserve over by Sarasota Square Mall. So today I wanted to talk to you all about some of our noteworthy plants found in primarily Sarasota and Manatee County. Some of these species also range outside of our two counties in this area. So just a little quick background. Um, this is from the Florida Plant Atlas, which I'm assuming many of you are familiar with. It's a great resource. If you haven't checked it out, you can uh, identify plants on that site, see what counties they're found in or have been vouchered in anyway. And um, the photos are excellent. They're a really good resource to sometimes compare different species in the same genera to try to figure out which species you have. So um, in short, but Florida is really botanically rich. Our state contains more than about 4,700 plant species. And of those, about 68% are natives and about a third, 32% are non-natives. Um, the vast majority of the plants that we have here are flowering plants. Uh, about 30, about 4,100 4, species of the 4,700 are flowering plants. So I wanted to focus on some species that we consider to be noteworthy in our area, um, namely species that are endemic, which are found only in Florida, and some of them are only found in a small area of Florida. Um, some of our listed species, the threatened and endangered species, and a few non-natives. We won't really uh, dwell too much on those because this is the Florida Native Plant Society after all. So for endemic species, uh, what we mean by that, again, is species that occur only in Florida. Um, some of them occur in just a few counties or a couple localities in the state, and some are much more widespread but don't really range naturally outside of Florida. So of the 4,700 species, only 230 are endemic to Florida. So that's kind of a small percentage, but um, compared to other states, we actually have a relatively high rate of endemism in Florida. And some of the areas in Florida are considered endemism hotspots, places like the Apalachicola River Basin up in the Panhandle. Um, in that area, we get a lot of 
temperate species that kind of reach their southern extreme of their limits. Um, also the Lake Wales Ridge, of course, and the, pine, the Miami Dade Pine Rockland habitat are just three good examples of endemism hotspots. Um, and those are areas where there's a high rate of endemic plants that occur there naturally. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch into some of the endemic plants that we would see in Sarasota and Manatee counties. And keep in mind, this is not comprehensive. I did not show all of them, but I tried to select uh, those that I had really good photos for uh, plants that you might see when you go out in some of our natural areas. So this first one is one that I don't really encounter very often. Um, this one's called Florida Indian Plantain. And these photos were taken actually out at Old Mayaca Preserve. Uh, this is a plant that likes to grow in really dry, sandy, scrubby soil. So it occurs in really sunny, open, very white, dry, sandy soils. Um, and one thing that's really cool is the flowers look really waxy. It almost looks plastic when you look at the plant. And they don't last very long, but when it blooms, they're really kind of cool, especially up close. Um, but uh, we have a fairly small little population of this plant that grows out at Old Mayaca. And you can see on each slide in the lower left corner, I've tried to include a map that shows which counties in Florida these plants have been vouchered in. Keep in mind that, um, for instance, you'll see up, uh, I believe that's Lafayette County, I'm not sure, but up kind of toward the Florida Panhandle, there's one county that's white, but it's surrounded by green counties. Um, sometimes these plants occur in those counties, they just haven't been documented there yet. So it's probably pretty likely that it occurs in that county also, and possibly Pinellas, I'm not sure. That one's not highlighted either on this one. And one that I see fairly commonly, especially in areas that are burned on a relatively frequent basis, is the Florida milkweed. Um, this one is uh, more of a Central Florida specialty, kind of Southwest Florida. And um, this one has really narrow leaves, so it doesn't provide much food for monarch caterpillars. Um, I believe they will feed on it, but uh, there are definitely other native milkweeds that are probably better monarch hosts than this one. But it is a really cool one. It's got kind of white flowers with the purplish center. And another one uh, that's found here locally is called Florida Green Eyes. I love the flowers on this one because it looks like the green disc flowers. Um, it looks like the yellow ray flowers are almost like pasted on to the disc flowers. So it's kind of interesting the way the flower is assembled in this plant. And you can see by the leaves that it has these really interesting kind of scalloped edges to the leaves. This is also another plant that likes to grow in fairly dry situations. Uh, sometimes they will grow in, in pine flatwoods or music flatwoods areas as well. This is one that I don't really see very often in Sarasota County. Uh, there are some places in Manatee that I know this occurs. Um, and this photo is actually taken up at Boyd Hill in St. Petersburg. Um, but this is called Pineland Rayless Goldenrod. And there's actually a population of these that have been planted there, I believe, by Bach Towers uh, rare plant folks. And they're monitoring this population up at Boyd Hill. So um, there's uh, the Pineland Rayless Goldenrod and also lots of Florida Golden Aster that have been outplanted there as well. Another one that likes scrub habitat, really dry, white, sandy soil. Um, it, it does grow well in areas that are burned frequently to help burn out the understory and provide open spaces for the species to grow. And this is one that I see um, on many of our sites. This is called Florida Scrub Rosling. It's in the family um, that spider warts are in. It's a type of spider wart. The flowers on this one are kind of a pinkish color, um, unlike the, 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 the the, I can't talk now. Unlike the native spider wart with the blue flowers that probably most of us are familiar with, um, this one's a pretty low growing plant and usually has leaves that are almost like blades of grass. So they're real fine leaves, 
but the flowers are definitely something that stands out. And um, look for these pink flowers. They bloom pretty much throughout the late spring and into the summer months in our area. Now, I didn't know until a couple of years ago that this plant that I've always called vanilla plant is actually a sub or a variety actually of another Carpheferous odoratissimus that occurs a little bit further north of us in Florida. Um, the, the variety that we have here is called Pineland Purple. It also does have flowers and sometimes leaves when you crush them up that smell like vanilla. So, um, but this is a variety that grows in Central and South Florida. And I love it in areas that have been burned. Sometimes it really responds well. Like the picture in the middle there, you can see just kind of a purple haze in the understory. And that's all Pineland purple that's in bloom. Um, so it does respond really well to fire. This is one that I don't see often, but if you go out to Old Mayaka Preserve, we have a really healthy population of scrub wild olive. This is a plant that definitely prefers really well-drained scrub soil and um, fairly frequent burning as well. <clears throat> it produces these fruit that look like olives. I don't know if they're edible. I, I don't know, I haven't read whether or not those are edible. And then uh, prior to that, that it gets clusters of small whitish or cream color flowers that really attract a lot of bees. So it's a really good pollinator type plant. And this one's a really fairly narrowly endemic plant. It really just only occurs in the central Florida area. <clears throat> one that you've probably seen, um, this one's called Chapman's Pea or Florida Alicia. This is another plant that prefers drier, scrubby areas, but sometimes will grow in flatwoods as well, music flatwoods. Um, this one tends to bloom in the morning, and then usually by afternoon, the flowers close up completely. So the best time to find these is in the morning if you go out on some of our natural areas. If you look at the picture in the lower right corner, you can see that the plants are really hairy up close. And if you look at that stem that leads up to where the flower is, it's got lots of small hairs on it. In, in the wild, the plants are also very hairy and grow about mm, 12 to 18 or so inches tall. If you all ever ride your bikes on the Legacy Trail, you have probably seen this clematis. It's like the most common place that I find it, which is really interesting. Um, it's typically a plant that comes up after prescribed fire, but I believe that because the, the, road, the trail shoulders are mowed pretty frequently along the Legacy Trail, it kind of promotes this one to bloom. And mostly throughout the summer months, you'll just see these occasionally along the edge of the Legacy Trail. Um, but it's a really cool flower. Um, they always are nodding like this, so they're real distinctive and easy to find. There's some color va variation in the flowers. They can be kind of pinkish, um, sometimes more lavender or purple color as well. So there are lots of clematis species, and this is one of our endemic native ones that we have here. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is a plant that we don't see a lot. Um, I have seen these out at Casperson Intercoastal Park. Um, we also have some out at Old Mayaka Preserve. It's another scrub specialty plant. Um, sometimes they'll also grow in sandhill habitat. So, um, but it likes, it definitely prefers dry areas. And it, as the name implies, it blooms sort of toward the end of summertime and into the fall. Um, so it's actually blooming now if you're out in the right natural areas and you might run into some of these. The foliage is really interesting on it. It's kind of like um, a real, it almost looks legume-like, um, uh, and but it is, um, I can't remember, it might actually be in the legume family, so that might be why it looks like that. But um, anyway, um, it's got really interesting foliage and the flowers are really spectacular when it blooms another plant of very dry areas. 
This is a plant that you see more in coastal areas. Um, I know that there's a lot of this that grows up at Robinson Preserve up in Manatee County and also along some of our Sarasota County beaches kind of in the back dunes and kind of toward uh, more of the like maritime hammock areas. It's not really an open uh, sand dune plant, but it grows kind of more behind the dunes and in sheltered a little bit more moist areas. Uh, it's called Florida Yellow Tops. And um, it, when it blooms, it's really quite spectacular. It gets these multitudes of small yellow flowers that form kind of flat heads on the plants. And I think the plants are really attractive too. They have this really pretty kind of maroon stem. So even when it's not blooming, it has these kind of maroon or purplish dark burgundy stems. This is another one that's a narrow endemic. It really only occurs in Southwest Florida in the wild. Of course, you can buy these plants and plant them elsewhere, but this is where it would naturally be found in our area. Oh, I should add that it attracts a ton of pollinators. I have some at my house and the bees especially love it, but some of the butterflies will visit it also. Probably most of us have seen this one. Um, this is our variety of beach sunflower. This one's called the West Coast Dune Sunflower. There are actually several varieties of these, um, other varieties that are native to the East Coast of Florida. This is our Southwest Coast native variety. And some people also call this one the hairy beach sunflower. And if you look at the stem up to the flower head, you can see the plants are very hairy in this variety. Um, some, of the sub, some of the varieties that grow on the east coast of Florida don't really have this hairiness to them. So they're, they, the flowers look the same, but the plants look slightly different. A plant of the beaches, for sure. This is another one that, believe it or not, I see mostly along the Legacy Trail. But um, if, you've, if you go into some marsh areas, you can also find this plant growing as well. This is our alligator lily. It's one of the spider lilies that's native to our part of Florida. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to explain when sometimes plants will have like a disjunct range and there's like a couple counties like the Jacksonville area, Duval County up in North Florida that apparently also have this species, but it's not connected to the rest of the range that's more central in South Florida. But these flowers are really pretty. Um, they are usually about four or five inches across. So they're hard to miss, um, but they really put on quite a show. And this species puts up a stalk that has a single bloom on it. There are other spider lilies that are native to Florida that produce multiple flowers on the same stalk. But this one always only produces one flower per stalk. Now you probably haven't seen this one. This is not a very common plant, even in areas where it occurs. Um, so this one is called scrub holly and it looks for all intents and purposes like an American holly. The only thing is that it grows in extremely dry scrub habitat. So if you find a holly that has these American holly like leaves growing in a very dry scrub habitat, then chances are it's scrub holly. And where they occur, um, I've seen these in the Ocala National Forest on many occasions up there. Um, I believe there's some scrub areas in Manatee County where some of these are found as well. I've looked for it in Sarasota County, but I haven't seen it in the wild here. So I, I just, it's funny because on the range map, it doesn't show Sarasota County. So it may actually not occur in our area, but it's really cool. It produces red holly berries on the female plants. And um, this one definitely resembles an American holly, much more so than a Dahoon holly that doesn't usually have as many teeth on the leaves. Oh, let's see. Okay. This is a plant that is easily missed. This is a very low growing species that occurs in kind of moist pinelands, uh, sometimes music flatwoods, but kind of wetter areas. And this one's called axle flower. It's a little bit hard to see in this picture, but the flowers actually are born in the leaf axles of the plant. So the stalk kind of comes out where the leaf joins the stem. Um, so they call this one axle flower. 
Um, not a lot to say about it. It's a real low growing plant. The leaves are kind of leathery and they've got these uh, series of kind of fine teeth along the leaf margins, but it's a really kind of cool looking flower up close when you find this plant. And one of our native prickly pears, I, for the longest time, thought that all of our prickly pears were Apuntia humifusa or Apuntia stricta, but in recent years, the taxonomists have broken many of these out into individual species, and Apuntia austrina is the common one that we find, not the shell mound cactus, but the other common prickly pear that we see in our area. Um, I'm not exactly real positive on how to differentiate these. So I, I don't know enough about them yet, but I think this is the one that we normally would see in our area. Um, you can sort of see some of the spines on a few of the pads. This one has gray spines, and this is a really healthy individual plant here in this picture with lots of blooms on it. These green metallic bees, and maybe some of you know the actual name of this bee, but these are really common occurrence on these prickly pear flowers. It's one of the primary pollinators. This is a really pretty palifoxia. Um, this is a uh, phase palifox. And we also have another species called coastal plain palifox where the flowers don't normally have this much burgundy or purple in them. And they look slightly different than this particular species. Uh, this one I see a lot at Old Mayaka. It also grows out at Oscar Shearer and some of the drier music flatwoods and some of the scrub areas out there. Um, and the flowers are really cool up close, you know, to look at it from a distance, it's not always very spectacular. And the plants tend to kind of grow in a straggly manner. So they can grow sometimes two or three feet tall, and then they just have like a few branches with flowers. So it's um, an interesting plant and the flowers are really pretty when you look at them up close. Another plant of dry areas. Boy, a lot of these endemics are really um, dependent on our scrub habitat. And this is another one. This is called Silk Bay or Scrub Bay. This is a type of red bay, red bay um, that grows in sand pine scrub for the most part. You can see in this picture, actually, there's kind of tips of a sand pine up in the upper left there. So this was in a scrub area. This one was actually taken up in the Ocala National Forest but this does also grow in Manatee County. I've looked for it in some of our scrub habitats in Sarasota County, but I haven't come across this one so far. So I'm not sure if we actually have it here in our county or not. I wish I'd gotten a better picture of this because it shows the flower in great detail, but it doesn't really show the plant. So this is a plant called Florida False Sunflower. And the only place I've seen these in our area is that old Mayaka Preserve. Um, it's another one that comes back well after an area is burned. And um, the way that I identify this plant is it grows usually about maybe two feet tall. It's got really small leaves along the stems. So they're kind of alternating leaves, but they're real small. They're not as long as the narrow leaf sunflower leaves. Um, or the other sunflowers that are native in our area. So it's got real small leaves. It puts up a single stem that has a single bloom at the top of it. And sometimes they'll grow in a clump. So there'll be several plants of it, or maybe they're clones, I'm not sure, but um, each stalk only produces one flower at the top of the stalk. It's really pretty. The flowers are usually maybe two to three inches across. So they're a good size uh, aster. Another one with a disjunct range in one county up in the Panhandle, which is kind of interesting. And it probably occurs in Hardy County also. It just doesn't show it on this one. This is our yellow bachelor's button or yellow milkwort, Polygula rugelii. This is a plant that actually likes wetter areas. And so often we'll see this on the edges of marshes, um, in low depressional areas and music flatwoods. Um, areas that tend to stay wet for a longer hydro period than some of the drier upland areas. 
Um, polygolas, there's, boy, there's a bunch of them that grow in our area and grow in all types of conditions from dry scrub habitat um, to wet areas. And this is definitely one that prefers the wetter areas. These grow about 12 inches or so tall and have just this really pretty lemon yellow colored um, flower head at the top of the stem. And people are, uh, this is another one that might probably be overlooked a lot. Um, this is called scrub palmetto. If you were walking through an area where this occurs in the scrub, you might just think it's kind of part of the saw palmettos that are everywhere. But if you look at these closely, it's related to our cabbage palm and it actually has leaves very much like a cabbage palm. The only difference to me that's really easy to identify in the field is if you see a plant that has an inflorescence on it or berries on it that's trunkless but looks like a cabbage palm, then it's either sable etonia if it's in a really dry scrub habitat or sable minor, which is the blue stem palmetto. And that one grows in really low wetland areas, kind of along creek banks and riverine areas. So the trunkless sables that we have in our area either grow in the scrub, like the scrub palmetto, or in the bottomland forests around the creeks and rivers. And that one is called blue stem palmetto. The blue stem is not endemic to Florida. Um, I actually was up at Congaree National Park up in South Carolina a couple of years ago. And I think that might be the northernmost range of blue stem palmetto, but I was surprised there is a pretty healthy population of it growing up there in the floodplain of that area too. And we have a couple different species of leather ferns that grow in our area. By far, the most common one is the giant leather fern. But occasionally in some salt marshy areas, you'll find golden leather fern. And the way you can tell these two apart is on the golden leather fern, if you look at the leaflets on each of the leaves, um, the leaflets toward the tops of the leaves are the ones that have the fertile kind of brown suede like spores on the backs. On a giant leather fern, the entire leaf with all the leaflets will have spores on the fertile leaves. So if you find a leather fern where only the tips of the leaves have fertile uh, leaflets, then it's golden leather fern. And I do see this one a lot um, down in South County. I think uh, Mayaka Islands Preserve has a pretty healthy population of it. And I think there's some also mixed in kind of along the Mayaka River as you get downstream quite a ways, kind of more brackish water areas. This is one that's pretty well restricted to the coastal areas of South Florida. This plant is really beautiful. And um, I was really fortunate when I was working for the Florida Park Service, I used to manage, uh, I used to, used to oversee parks that were in the district from Manatee County down to Collier County. And one time I was out at, up in Manatee County, up at Wingate Creek Preserve and just walking through the scrub with Dr. Wonderland from USF. And we happened to find uh, Florida Bonamia growing there. And it had not been seen in Manatee County, I think since the early 1900s. So I was really excited back in the 1990s that I rediscovered this plant in Manatee County. Um, historically, they also occurred in Sarasota County in some of our scrub habitat. I've searched all the scrubs that I've been in in the county and I haven't seen it here. So maybe other people might know of where it might grow in Sarasota County, but I haven't seen it in our county. So it might be extirpated from Sarasota County. It's really pretty. It usually blooms in August um, and it doesn't have a long bloom season. So August is the best time to search for this. It's a trailing vine uh, that grows on scrub on white sand with opposite leaves and um, typical morning glory type flowers. Beautiful blue color. This is a super narrow endemic that um, only occurs in five counties in Southwest Florida. Um, this is the Florida golden aster. We have tons and tons of grass-leaved golden aster, which you see everywhere in the flat woods and in scrub areas. But the Florida golden aster has a really 
kind of um, very unique look about it. If you look at the overall plants on the right side, you can see how silvery the leaves are and they're kind of rounded. So they um, form this really cool pattern along the stems, these kind of rounded silvery leaves. And you can kind of see them a little more up close in the picture on the left there. Um, very reduced leaves, but very silvery. Um, not long and pointed like the Florida Golden Aster leaves. This is also another scrub plant. This is called Garbaria. It's a wonderful pollinator shrub. And this grows into a woody shrub. So it'll get um, four or five, maybe even taller, four or five feet tall. Um, I see these occasionally up at Lake Manatee State Park up in Bradenton, uh, up in the sand pine scrub areas. And um, I am not sure if we have this in Sarasota County. I haven't ever run into it down here and it doesn't show that it's been vouchered from our county. So we may not have it in Sarasota County, but it's a beautiful shrub um, and it blooms real profusely, usually in October-ish or so, maybe early November, um, but it's got these really pretty light lavender flowers, attract tons of pollinators. And you've probably been lucky enough to find one of these pine lilies. This is a relatively frequent plant that we find in um, pretty regularly burned flatwoods areas uh, or palmetto prairies as well. Um, these grow, I've seen them at Oscar Shearer in some areas. They grow out at Mayaka River State Park. We find them at the Carlton Reserve. Um, there are some that grow at Curry Creek Preserve. I have searched high and low at Old Mayaka Preserve because we have some really nice flatwoods over on the east side of the preserve but I have never found a pine lily out there. So I don't know if maybe it just never occurred out there or maybe at some point they were collected from that site, I don't know. But I'm always hoping to be surprised one day in September or October and see one of these bright reddish orange lilies poking up through the flatwoods. Now, this is a pretty um, widely distributed species. And um, this grows actually throughout the Southeastern United States. Let me go back. Um, so when we got back to, but when we started with Bonamia, we were actually starting on some of the listed species. So the Bonamia is not only state endangered, but it's federally threatened and it's also endemic to Florida. So it's got all three categories covered. Uh, the Florida golden aster is even more endangered since it's just so narrowly found in Florida federally endangered, state endangered, and of course also endemic to just our few counties here. And the Garbaria is state threatened and also endemic to Florida. Now the pine lily, though it's threatened, as I mentioned, it's found in a wider distribution and kind of occurs all throughout the southeastern coastal plain in uh, frequently burned habitats, mostly pine flatwoods. This is a plant that's also easy to step over and not even notice. Um, this is a small loose strife called Florida loose strife. That's a small trailing plant. It often grows in like Bahia grass areas, but usually next to wetter um, habitat. So oftentimes kind of along marshy areas or um, natural areas that are wet for many months out of the summer. Um, this one I uh, photographed at Curry Creek Preserve, um, and it was in a Bahia grass area, but it was kind of close to some marshy areas. Um, it's a, tra a trailing plant that has these really small lavender flowers, and each petal has a dark streak of purple, like right down the mid vein of the petal. Really pretty flowers when you look at them up close. It definitely prefer prefers wetter areas, and so lowland blue strife is a good name for it. This one's state endangered and also endemic to Florida. Many people are surprised to learn that we have a prickly pear cactus of all things that's state threatened. Um, this is the, the less common of the prickly pears that we have in our area. This is the shell mound prickly pear, also called erect prickly pear. 
And the way this one differs is that the spines are yellow on this particular plant. Um, it also typically grows in shell midden areas or along coastal areas, uh, sometimes right in the sand dunes, sometimes back behind the dunes. But um, this one is listed as threatened now because of probably 10 or 15 years ago, um, a moth called a cactoblasted moth was accidentally introduced into Florida. Um, and I'm not sure if it came in on some exotic cacti or how it got here, but um, that moth actually lays eggs in the pads of the cactus and the caterpillar eats the insides of the leaves. So sometimes you'll come across these cactus that have been affected by the cactoblasted moth. It'll have pads that are kind of dried up or they look like they've had like leaf miners or something working inside the pads. And sometimes they can be totally lethal to the plant. So because of that, this plant is now on the threatened species list. And this was a fun discovery that I made a few months ago out in some of the newly acquired parts of Old Mayaka Preserve. Uh, this is our leafless beaked ladies tresses orchid or leafless beaked orchid. It has this really pretty kind of salmon or kind of hot, not really hot pink, but kind of salmon or kind of like a reddish color. And there are two species. One actually produces leaves that remain with the plant when it blooms. This particular species blooms and there are no leaves present on the ground. Um, and this is the, the rarer of the two. This one is called, this is a state threatened species. Um, it's interesting that these seem to persist in old pasture areas. I used to see these on roadsides quite a bit, like 20 or 30 years ago, but I think they get mowed so often now that you hardly ever see them on the roadsides anymore but um, occasionally you'll find them like popping up in pastures and old disturbed areas. It's pretty unique though, it's pretty neat. And you might be surprised to know that our native inkberry that grows on the beaches is actually a state threatened plant. Um, this one is also um, has a lot of competition from the invasive Scavola toccata, uh, which is another, uh, inkberry that comes in and, and infests the beach areas. Um, this particular one, our native one, produces black berries when they're ripe. But I don't know why of all the plant pictures I have, I don't have an inkberry plant picture with black berries. But anyway, the one on the left has green immature berries that will turn black. And um, this is in the, the plant family that they, or the plant group that they call half flower plant because if you look at the flowers, they sort of look like there's only half of a flower there. But our native one produces blackberries when they ripe, ripen, and um, the leaves are kind of a fleshy leaf on this one. On the invasive one, they're more of a kind of papery leaf. They're not nearly as leathery and fleshy as our native inkberry. And the exotic one produces white berries when they're ripe. So the blackberries are our native and the white berries are the non-native. One of our many beautiful native bromeliads, this is the cardinal air plant. Uh, this one's Tillandsia fasciculata. This one is not as common, I don't think, as our giant air plant. Uh, this one tends to grow more in riverine situations. Um, sometimes I see them along the Mayaka River at the Jelks Preserve. We have them at Mayaka River State Park. Um, they don't grow as much in upland areas as they do kind of along rivers and hammocks along the river's edge. Um, and they're super easy to ID when they're blooming. Of course, they produce this kind of cardinal colored spike of flowers or bracts. The flower is actually the purple, purple tubular flower that you see in that center picture. And uh, the plants always have kind of this silvery look to them. It's a pretty, pretty air plant. And our bromeliads, uh, this giant wild pine and the cardinal air plant are both on the state endangered species list now, of course, thanks to the evil weevil that was introduced several years ago. Um, and so it's always a good idea not to collect these in the wild and transport them to other places. You might be moving the evil weevils around. And I know that there are groups here in town um, working at the Carlton Reserve and elsewhere that are rescuing these plants in the wild. 
keeping them in cages until they bloom and produce seed and then going back out and redistributing the seed in the wild. So we're hoping that we can maintain these populations at least for the short term anyway. So, um, but this is our giant air plant. This is the one that I see more commonly. And this grows in sometimes on pine trees as you see in the center picture, but most often you see these up in large live oaks and they tend to grow in any kind of shady hammocky area. Um, sometimes, like I say, in pine flat woods uh, and along rivers. So they're kind of, they have a little bit broader, I think, habitat range than the cardinal air plant. So I'm not going to talk a lot about exotics because we're the Native Plant Society. You guys are probably super familiar with some of our bad exotics, but I just picked out a couple that are um, really particularly bad ones that we deal with here in our area. Um, I'm sure that you probably know all of these, but um, just for review, this one is called Rosary Pea, and this grows on a vine, produces these pods of red and black hard seeds. They contain a toxin called abrin, which is a nerve toxin. So they're super poisonous if eaten and chewed. So um, I always tell people if they have small kids to make sure they don't pick these berries and these seeds and try to eat them. Um, but anyway, they're super toxic, not to touch, but if you bite them and, and swallow them. Um, and this is a FLEPSI category one, Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. They've actually changed that to Florida Invasive Species Council. So it should say FISC category one. I didn't catch that one on this slide. I did, I corrected it, I think on the rest of them. So this is another common one. People love this one for landscaping, but it's a plant we love to hate. It's called Mexican petunia. This in our natural areas tends to infest kind of wetter locations and shady areas. Uh, this one is a problem for us up at Circus Hammock Preserve up on 17th Street. That site's a kind of a forested wetland that stays flooded often for six months out of the year. So it really likes those really shady wet areas. <clears throat> and these seeds can persist for years. My neighbor had planted some at the house next door they remove them and for several years after that, I was pulling them up in my landscape. So it's crazy how they spread and the seeds can pers persist for a long time. And of course, I'm sure everybody knows Brazilian pepper. There are just tens of thousands of acres of this all throughout South and Central Florida. The thing that I found interesting on the range map is it looks like maybe it's because of climate change. I'm not sure, but it looks like it's starting to kind of creep further north in Florida. Um, like 20 or 30 years ago, and more than 30 years ago now, when I worked at Wakaiwa Springs State Park in the Orlando area, we would occasionally find Brazilian pepper, but it was not very common because it was too cold up there. But it looks like on this map, it might be kind of creeping north as time goes along. Of course, birds love these, they spread them. Raccoons will eat them and spread them. This tree has male and female trees. So if you don't see any berries this time of the year, especially it's probably a male tree and the female trees are the ones that produce the fruit. Category one invasive, which is worst of the worst. And another one that's quite a pest is Caesar weed. Uh, I'm always amazed when I take people on nature walks, how people just love how beautiful these flowers are, but um, they don't associate the blooms with the, the burrs that the plant produces. And they stick to your clothes, they stick in pet fur, animals transport them. So um, it's definitely a real problematic plant. It's really easy to identify with the leaves. They're very distinct shape and they're real kind of fuzzy. And um, of course, if the plants have the burrs on them, they, you'll see those. And I'm sure you've picked them out of your pet's hair and off your pant legs and socks and everything else. So I won't go into a lot of detail on the invasives, but um, if you go on the floridainvasivespecies.org website, there's really good information about all the invasive plants that are 
common in our area and actually some that are kind of up and coming problems that we're going to have to keep an eye out for. So if you haven't checked that site out, I encourage you to check it out and you might learn a whole bunch more about invasive plants. So I think that's basically all I have for you all today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you saw some plants that you weren't familiar with. Um, thank you all for coming and listening to the talk and being such a good audience. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And you were getting compliments in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> this is so interesting. Oh, cool. Yeah. So let's see here. We had all throughout, let's see, started back here. Okay. Um, what time? Okay, so the first question was from Kathy Page. What time of year does the Florida Indian plantain bloom? Oh, good question. Um, that one is kind of like a late spring plant. And it's so funny, it blooms and then the plant pretty well dies. So um, they pop up really quickly. They bloom for a month or so, and then they kind of die back and you don't see them again until next spring. So um, it looks like something that would persist, but I think it's a perennial. It just kind of dies back after blooming and then comes back again the next year. Okay. And then, um, oh, I threw in there. I was, I don't, I'm not a scientific name person. So I, I was like, oh, when you're talking about the Florida milkweed, I was thinking, oh, is that the same as the aquatic milkweed? It's not. Not. Mm -mm. Okay. But they're both white. They're both white. The aquatic milkweed um, has white flowers. It usually has a cluster of many white flowers are kind of small. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Florida milkweed maybe produces five to seven sometimes flowers, but a lot sparser clusters of flowers and the individual flowers are a little bit larger on that one. Okay, good to know. Mm -hmm. All right, and we had a question from Susie Venters. Where was your sighting of the scrub roastling? Oh, um, that one, I have seen that one out at um, Curry Creek Preserve in the Longleaf Flatwoods out there and some of the scrubby Flatwoods areas. Um, it also grows out at Old Mayaka Preserve. Seems like everything grows out there. Um, I'm not sure if there's other places in the county that I've run into it, but really commonly out at Curry Creek and also out at um, Old Mayaka in the summertime. Okay. Um, Eric Garduno asked, can you share if there is a if there is a way to get some of these plants for our yard, like that purple haze. Oh, um, I'm sure that there are some native plant nursery people on here like Tom and probably Richard. <laughs> but um, I think some of those species are probably available at Sweet Bay and probably other native nurseries in our area. Um, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I have seen it at, at Sweet Bay. Okay. Um, does, this is from Linda Kitch, does Dunes Dune sunflower cross with, is it the helianthi in the wild? Am I saying that right, helianthi? Yes, yeah, so, um, so one of the things that um, was an issue, and I don't know if it still probably is an issue, is that um, the different species, the different varieties of dune sunflower that occur naturally in Florida have been kind of planted in all different place, places in the state, coastal areas. And so um, there was a lot of concern about genetic um, pollution, I guess you call it, when um, like the non-native strain kind of crosses with some of the native strains in other areas. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has happened over time just because they've been, they weren't well understood. And so different varieties were planted in the wrong places in Florida. Okay. Mm -hmm. um... Oh, I threw in another one. Just out of curiosity, do you know if the scrub holly is caffeinated like the dahoon and the Yapu, the yupon? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm always looking for the caffeinated option. That's fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Allison Bishop is saying she really enjoys Jeff's talk. Great details. Great. And Elliot Prout has a question. Does the scrub palmetto have 
Costa Pomate, is it Petioli? Like other stables? Like our yes. other stables? Yes. The leaves look almost the same as like a cabbage palm leaf. They have um, that kind of midrib that kind of uh, curls like downward on the underside of the leaf. Not as pronounced as a cabbage palm, but um, the petiole comes to kind of a spear point on the leaf blade on the on the scrub palmetto and also the blue stem palmetto too. Okay. So all the sables kind of have that characteristic. Okay. And let's see. Oh, Pam Callender said that she has a flowering um, garbaria in her backyard garden, and it's beautiful. oh, I love it. Yep. Yeah, they they attract so many pollinators too. The the bees and butterflies love that plant. Elliot Prout again says, "Does the cardinal air plant die after blooming?" I think that one actually. Um, I don't remember now if that one dies. I know that one tends to produce a lot of pups at the base of the plant after it flowers. So I'm not sure if the original blooming part of the plant dies. I think it might die, but it produces a whole bunch of baby plants at the base, um, which is not typical of the giant air plant. That one blooms and then it dies. Okay. Oh, and then Susie Ventures says, do you have context for, is it Talanthia? Uh, Talanthia rescuers. She thinks she saw one at Little Manatee River SP Sunday. Okay. Um, I know in our area, I don't know if you all know Donna Day and Ernie Wynn. I think Ernie was in this meeting. Um, I know they do a lot of Talanzia rescues in Sarasota County. So I'm not sure like how far outside this area they, they travel, but um, they've been great. They've um, relocated plants from different preserves that we find them on to try to perpetuate the population. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ernie wins in, in here. Yes. Okay. Um, Allison Bishop, sometimes the berries are used as, oh, oh this was when the uh, we were talking about the rosary pea. Sometimes mm -hmm. the berries are used as eyes and carved wood imposts. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. hmm. um, oh, and Elliot, regarding climate change, Elliot Prout said that a Brazilian pepper was found in South Carolina recently. Really? Oh, that's that's interesting and scary at the same time. Mm. Hmm. Um, Trent Berry is saying thank you. Pamela Callender is saying great information. Thank you. Very helpful. Elliot Prout, have you seen is it Athamina, Minnesota in Sarasota? Am I saying that right? You know, um, it's so funny. Um, if you go on the Florida Plant Atlas site, you can actually click on um, some of the old herbarium specimens and they actually have all of those digitized in there. So you can view them. And for listed plants, they don't tell you the exact location where they were collected because they don't want people to go remove them. But um, there was some Asimina Minnesota, I think that's the species anyway, that one was collected in Sarasota County, but I think that population is probably gone now. It was on private pasture land and, the area where I think it occurred, it gets mowed really frequently. And I drove by there one day, but it doesn't look like there's anything that looks like the pawpaw out there now. Okay. Um, Lucinda Jane said, thank you. That was so informative. Startling how many state threatened plants there are. Mm -hmm. Ernie Wynn said, Jeff, excellent presentation. Thank you. Is Old Mayaka Preserve open or closed due to Ian? It's open, but there is a lot of damage out there. Um, we, we have cleared the trails, so they're accessible and safe to walk. Um, but in the natural areas out there, there's a lot of breakage. There's a lot of branches hanging. So it's really kind of a mess out there. But the trails are accessible and you can walk. And we have done a couple of recent burns out there. So over the next few weeks, it might be kind of cool to see how those areas come back. Oh, and uh, Tom might be able to comment on this. Lucinda Jane also said she thinks it was a, gar a garbaria that she bought last week at Sweet Bay. Nice. Oh, and he says some of the plants on the presentation are available in trade, but not all of them. Uh, Susan Sindlinger said, what a fascinating talk. Learned so much. Thank you. Great. Um, 
Well, you guys are going to laugh, but I learned some stuff too. Like I had no idea how many of our local plants are actually endemic. Like I know some of them, but I, when I like started looking into it, I was like, gosh, we have a lot of plants that are endemic here. So yeah. it's pretty interesting. Oh, Ernie Wynn posted his email for the uh, rescues. And let's see, Sherman Linda said, we only have permits for the Tillis, what is it? How do you say this? Uh, Tillandsia? Tillandsia. Tillandsia app in Sarasota County. Thanks, Jeff. Fantastic presentation. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. All the iNaturalist IDs. Uh, oh, yes. I, I love to go on there and ID stuff when I find it. So, yeah. And I post a lot on there too. So, and what was um, the leafless beaked orchid was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And also there was one that was yellow and it looked like a cascading, it was a milk something, milk, was it milkweed? Oh, the milkwort, I think. Milkwort, yeah. That Gorgeous. yellow, that yellow bachelor button. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous, yes. Okay, so now I have some new favorites too. Yeah, this is great. Um, <laughs> great. I think that's all for now. Uh, yeah, that was, that's everything. And yeah, overall, absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, glad oh. to do it. All right. And yeah, to everybody, don't forget, we have um, our board meeting. If anybody's interested, please reach out uh, the srapens at gmail.com and we can get you access to that board meeting uh, first Monday in December. And yeah, and oh, hopefully we get to see a lot of you guys at our party as well on the 19th. Okay. So bye guys. Thank you all. Great job. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.